the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 29, wrote these words. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And a few words later he said, For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Earlier in that book and throughout the New Testament, we see that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3. And at the end of the divine volume, the last book of the Bible, Revelation 14 and verse 13, a beatitude is given, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Earlier, Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. To the young preacher Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, he declared to him concerning his own faithful work in the church, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, one of the main things that I want you to see here is that all the blessings mentioned in these few verses are for those who are in, I, in, in Christ. One cannot get into Christ unless they are baptized into Christ. One is not ready to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of sins if that person has not confessed that Christ is the Son of God. One is not ready to do that except that one obeys the command to repent of one's sins, Acts 17.30. And prior to repentance, one must be brought to belief in Christ, Romans 10, 17. Matthew 10, 32 is involved here. In order for one to then take the next steps. It is the totality of the teaching of the New Testament that sets out the complete plan of salvation. You do not find all of what God requires of us in just one verse. You cannot see in one verse the idea of you must hear the gospel or that you must believe in Christ or that you must repent of your sins or you must confess your faith in Christ or you must be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins in one verse. One must realize, though, God wrote the Bible. Just because he used humans to write it doesn't mean God didn't write it. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Thus, when I read Matthew writing about Christ, or I read Paul saying something, or I find Peter saying something in the New Testament, it is God saying it because God inspired them. The word inspiration that I quoted a moment ago where Paul wrote to Timothy, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, is a compound Greek word, theophanoustos, and it simply means God breathed. 
the scriptures, as it were, or as God breathing out from the depths of his being, the will of God to man. He did it in words. He made us able to understand him. He made us rational intellectual creatures. And he appeals to us on the basis of evidence. He appeals to us to use our minds to think. And so we find faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that's essential. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek after Him, Hebrews 11 and 6. So when I see God in any one part of the last will and testament of His Son, which is the New Testament, telling us his will and I see what the Bible teaches concerning salvation then I learn the totality or the whole of the plan of salvation by seeing the different parts of it if a person is already a believer in Christ then I don't have to tell that person he must believe but that's not all I'm going to leave it with is with belief because I have Acts 17.30 and other passages. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I can't leave that out. That's God's word, just like belief is. I see in Romans 10 and verse 10 that confession is made unto salvation. But that doesn't rule out belief and repentance, and repentance doesn't rule out confession of faith. But I only find one place for the one who is a penitent believer being put into, I-N-T-O, into Christ. One doorway, and that's what we read in Galatians 3, 27, that one is baptized into Christ. For all of those who say, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Folks, all these scriptures I read to you said all of these blessings that God has for us is in Christ. In simply shows a relationship. It's a preposition. One of the things you do in learning a, a language, a second language, is one of the, besides the vocabulary, of course, and numerous other things regarding its grammar, but one of the first things you're going to teach you are the prepositions. We're in this building, and we came into this building from the outside of the building. And when we leave the building, we'll travel from the building. All those little words show relationships. And so where do all these scriptures locate all the blessings God has for man, forgiveness of sins being one of them? Locates them in Christ. Well, then how can a person say that you don't have to be in Christ? have these things and how can a person say if they do believe you have to be in Christ to have what the Bible says is in Christ then how is it that we will not accept what the Holy Spirit said about being baptized into Christ because that's the way you get into him you can't get into him any other way you, you don't find the scripture saying believe into him repent into him or confess into him Truly, they're on the road to the door to getting into Christ. But that door into Christ is baptism. And that's why Peter would say in 1 Peter 3.21 that baptism doth also now save us. That doesn't rule out belief or hearing the word of God or repentance or anything else. But it says the doorway into Christ, the point where God says, your sins and your iniquities I will remember against you no more. Your sins are blotted out. Is when you're immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of your sins. You're baptized into Christ. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the gospel was first preached in its fullness, People were persuaded by the truth preached by Peter and the rest of the apostles that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The Word of God pricked them in their heart to make them realize that, yes, we're devout religious people. That's why we're here on that day. 
but we're lost, devout religious people. And we must change. So they were pricked in their heart by the truth of the gospel that Peter and the other apostles were preaching. And they interrupted Peter and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter took them as believers, notice, and commanded them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41 tells us, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And I learned from 41 and 42 and 47 that the Lord himself added them to the church. Well, the church is his spiritual body. That's the place where we just read about in all these scriptures a moment ago where all these blessings are located. Now, the apostle John wrote, the witness is this that God gave unto us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath the life. He that hath not the Son hath not the life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. Life is in the Son. Now, how do you get into the Son? Because when you get into the Son, you get into life. Spiritual life. You rise from the water and grave of baptism, a new creature in Christ, because your sins are washed away by the blood of the Lord. You are baptized into his death where he shed his blood, and he shed his blood for the remission of sins, Romans 6, 3 and 4, and Romans 6, 17 and 18. Truly, it brings great joy to our hearts. As Jesus says, it never grows old. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly John 10 and verse 10 but that life is in his son and you have to be in his son to enjoy that life and that life is a new creature in Christ and one is baptized into Christ to obtain remission of sins thus rising from the watery grave of baptism a new creature where in Christ the apostles also preach there is salvation and none other. Listen again. There is salvation and none other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 Now notice the latter part of that verse. We must be saved. This is imperative. This is obligatory. This means you can't be saved except by the authority of Jesus Christ. And that authority is set out in the words of Christ. It's most obvious to the serious Bible student that one must be in Christ. However, just as important is the fact that Christ must be in each one of us. Go sometimes, may it be very short time between you hearing this and you doing it, and look at the book of Colossians and read the words and think about it. It's summed up in one statement. Christ is the center of the Christian's life. That's what he's saying throughout the whole book. We are told if we were raised together with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, Colossians 3 and verse 1. It is in Christ that we're made complete, Colossians 2 and verse 10. And for the Christian, as that term is used and defined in the New Testament, Christ is all and in all. Chapter 3 and verse 11. So it, it's not an amazing thing to note that Paul taught, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Then he said, and that's what's written above me on the wall. And whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. But the one statement which continually 
sticks in my mind in this great book, this letter to the church of Colossae, Colossians 1.27, really sums up what this lesson is all about. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, Romans 8, 24 makes it clear that we're saved by hope. Hope means expectation. It's not some sort of fanciful wish that it might happen. It means what the faithful child of God has a right to expect when, he, when, he, when Christ comes back. To be raised in a glorified body, to inherit eternal life at the day of judgment, by hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there's the point that we ought to realize. It should be a comfort to all who've obeyed the gospel and are living the Christian life. And it should say to the person who has not done so, why? It's clear. It's plain. It's simple. It's in words on about a fifth grade level in English. What is there about it that says, I don't get it? And I think you'll find it's not a matter of lack of understanding the message in the simple words of the New Testament. It's a matter of an old stubborn will. It just simply says, I'm not going to do it. And I suggest to you that the biggest danger we have is found within our own selves. For me, for you, for everybody else. And that's my will. A lot of people ought to say, that they really spoke the truth from their inward man about themselves as to why they do or don't do many things. It's just this. I don't want to. <laughs> they would be honest at least. Why aren't you baptized for the remission of sins? I know you believe in Christ. I know you want to follow the Bible. If they'd be honest, they'd say, I don't want to. When one truly is converted, then they're giving all to Christ. They've turned to Christ for everything. Thus, when you obey the Gospels we've been studying, they're baptized into Christ, and in Christ they live. And thus Christ lives in us as we put into practice the truth of the New Testament in Christian living. The Bible forever teaches that it's not enough just to remove evil from our lives. Now, that's important. But we must also fill ourselves with that which is good, lest we end up in worse shape than we were, Luke 11, 24 through 26. As we surely remember that Jesus said, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. We also remember, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. So no wonder that the New Testament in one way or the other, the one extent of the other, exhorts every one of us as Christians to be living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service, Romans 12 and verse 1. That's a very important point. We are where God dwells. We do the work of God because we are the children of God. We are members of his spiritual body and our Lord is our only head and his will guides the body of which we are members in particular. And we act only as the mind of Christ guides us. That's the way that's right can't be wrong. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. It is then of the utmost importance that we remain pure as Christians and unspotted from the world. Jesus taught that at the very beginning of his work in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How can I make my heart pure? Well, the Bible tells me all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 respectively. How can I be clean? How can I be pure? 
Well, it won't come from any collection of ideas that originated with man. It won't come from anything that says, well, I deserve this because I've been such a good person. It'll come by simply submitting to the truth of God. I don't understand and never have, and it's a terrible thing among the denominations that they've told blinded to this, that they think that if a person obeys their Lord, they're trying to act in a meritorious way to obtain heaven. I, I don't understand that. God's favored us. We don't deserve salvation. You can't merit salvation. You can't earn salvation. God's grace or favor gave it to us even while we were yet sinners. It's still that way. But why can't people see that the Lord said it's free? So come and accept it. Oh, but if I take a step forward to get up there and accept it, then I'm trying to earn my salvation. You never learned that from your New Testament because it's not taught. If that's the case, then Jesus is contradicting himself when he says, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do, action on my part, do not the things which I say. The only way faith in God has ever saved anybody is when it was a living, active, obedient faith. So Christ finds no place to lodge in the life that is filled with worldliness and impurity. Now, of course, I speak to my brethren, those who have been immersed in water, those who have obeyed the gospel. It's not a matter of saying, I don't curse, I don't tell lies, I don't steal. All that stuff work of the flesh you can't do and you won't do if you're converted the way the New Testament sets out conversion. But it also tells us there are these things that we're to be busy about doing. Praying, studying the Bible, Practicing pure religion, which is being mindful of the orphans and widows and their afflictions, keeping oneself unspotted from the world, James 1.27. You can read about the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, and he ends that whole list by saying those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's obvious there are things to stop doing, and there are things to do. We learn the things to stop doing because they don't please our Lord and they're sinful by reading the Bible. We learn the things that we do that shows that we are Christians by reading the same Bible. And we do it all because we're converted. The Lord means more to us than anything else. He knows how to get me from earth to heaven. Nobody else does. He does. And he's blazed the trail by going before me. And he's left behind his last will and testament. And he says, here's how you get there. Come and follow me. Do those things that I leave for you to do. And you will be safe on the shore of eternity someday. Now the apostle Paul understood exactly what he was saying in Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And what is more important, he lived it. He lived it. He could say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians 1.21. Now you can't say the second part of what Paul says there without saying the first part. To die is gain is only for those who live as if Christ is all there is to existence. If we live as Paul did, then we can have the same expectation of glory, that same hope that he did. There shouldn't be a question at all in the minds of those with whom we come in contact just who our master actually is. They should be able, as they were the apostles, to see us and say he, he or she has been with Jesus. Acts 4.13. And they're servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 17 and 18. So I asked the question, am I a servant of righteousness? The Greek word for servant is slave. Am I slave to my king and master Christ? 
and I shackled myself to him because he's the only one that can get me successfully from here to heaven. And I don't want to lose out. We probably have all been there, but as little children in particular, our parents would hold our hands. Sometimes uh, it's to keep from running away from you. <laughs> Other times they want to hold your hand so they can feel secure. It's that second way that we who are children of God, the family of God, want to hold God's hand. Time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. If Christ is in us, then we'll go about doing good as the Bible defines what is good unto all men as we have opportunity as Paul taught in Galatians 6.10 and as the church did as you read about it in your own Bible in Acts chapter 10.38. We actually learn to count others better than ourselves, Philippians 2, 1 through 3, because we go about trying to teach them the way of salvation that somebody loved me enough to teach me when I was in sin to lead me out of it, to show me the way of righteousness, to show me heaven. Our purpose on earth will reflect the Lord's purpose. Let me say that again. Our purpose on earth will reflect the Lord's purpose. And what was that? The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10 Our constant prayer our constant attitude or state of mind or of life will be always cultivating not my will, but thine be done, Luke twenty two forty two. It is then when we reach that state of mind, that humble, lowly state of mind, that we will glorify the Father by bearing fruit of the kingdom, John 15, 8. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door. And knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20. But uh, it's only when we open the door of obedience, John 14.15, that that particular statement becomes reality and true to us. Christ in you. The hope of glory. I don't know whether you've ever noticed it, but I'll close with this. And it's based upon Revelation 3.20. Sometimes, I haven't seen one in a long time, there was a portrait done, and it's like a cottage home, and Jesus standing at the door. And he's sort of looking out at the audience, but he's knocking on the door. Somebody in looking at that one time challenged the artist on it and said, there's no doorknob on the door on the outside. And the artist said, no, that's, that's not a mistake. Because Jesus won't force that door. You have to open it and let him in. Now, that's an action on your part. I don't think anybody does that necessarily trying to merit their salvation and earn heaven. But they have to let him in. And whatever the Lord said you must do to let him in, which is to let him have his way with thee, and the only way you do that is to do his will, then that's what we ought to do. The attitude of speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command and I will obey, will always get you through as to how you live this life and how you approach the study of your Lord's will and incorporate the principles of righteousness into your life. Now, you'll notice as we went through this lesson, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that we talked about how to get into Christ, what one must do from the inside out, we might say, in order to become a Christian. Sadly, most people who name the name of Christ reject the simple plan of salvation. We studied it today. And it doesn't make any difference if the great majority of people that believe Christ is the Son of God accept it or reject it. It stays the same. You don't change the truth because a lot of people reject it. 
And we must realize that the Lord taught plainly that as far as the people, all the people who ever live, very, 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 very few will be saved. And it's because very, very, very few will simply submit to the teachings of God's will. Instead, they interject their own feelings, their own notions, their own views into things. We all face that. We can do it. It's easy to do it. But the Lord said you can do what's right because you can learn the truth and believe what's right and act upon it. As a child of God, if you sin, God's second law of pardon is, of course, repent of those sins. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. As we've studied then these things, we hope that you'll respond to the Lord's invitation as you need while we stand and while we sing.